Hello, good morning. I'm Ashok Rokade, consultant rhinologist and endoscopic based surgeon from Winchester and the University Hospital Southampton, UK. I welcome colleagues from around the world on behalf of our organizing team to this inaugural Winter Global Rhinology Endoscopic Sinus and Endoscopic Based Surgery webathon. Global Rhinology Network is a registered non-profit organization with a mission to foster surgical education in rhinology and skull base surgery we have successfully hosted annual multicenter live surgical webcast the lioness since 2014 in collaboration with lion foundation thousands of surgeons from all corners of the world have benefited from it more than 2000 surgeons from 110 countries have registered for grace 2020 we will have hugely informative and engaging sessions presented by eminent rhinologists and skull base surgeons from around the world grace 2020 is hosted at the global telemedicine studio of professor wilko gronman in utrecht in netherlands it is supported by metronic and carl stores thank you Imagine what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs. Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT navigation system. A customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image guided surgery technology, featuring six hardware configurations. an optional portable card two different electromagnetic emitter options with flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality get everything you need and nothing you don't with stealth station flex ent let's flex forward contact your medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you Without further ado, we'll uh, move further to Hisham's presentation. 
uh, I just put this uh, image of the skull to show the link or the relationship between the orbit and the sinuses in the lamina papyracea area and the area that we are able to decompress through the nose, which is that part of the lamina papyracea next to the ethmoid cells to the lacrimal bones and back to the optic nerve here below the skull base. And we can also go extend this into the optic floor to the infraoptic nerve to get a medial and um, uh, lower uh, wall uh, decompression of the orbits. To look at some history, uh, the first description of wall decompression was in 1911 by Dollinger, when he described the lateral wall decompression. In 1931, Napsikan described superior wall decompression, but this had a lot of risks, so it was abandoned. And later on, the medial wall decompression was described by Sewell in 1936 and the fear wall by Hutch. These both were combined by Walsh and Nagura in 1957, and this became the standard uh, decompression of the orbit, medial and fear wall, combined with lateral as needed. Until the 1990s, uh, when it was all done through an external approach, David Kennedy, the leader of sinus surgery, described in his copy transnatal organ compression when he presented five cases in his first paper published in that case. From then onwards, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, publications came to see the exponential increase of the number of publications on this copy organ compression. This is 1990, 2015, got from this uh, paper by Daniel Warman. So the numbers of series published in getting higher and higher, and it became the approach of choice for this kind of problem. Uh, in my experience, I've been doing this since 2002. The major or the main cause or the main indication for this is thyroid eye disease. Uh, there are some other rare indications or less common such as AV malformations. I'll show some examples later. Uh, lymphangioma, I've uh, done uh, for uh, open compression for that. Orbital xanthic granuloma, sphenoid wing meningiomas or orbital meningiomas, and also I've done it for cavernous sinus thrombosis, which uh, treated the eye with eyesight. Interestingly, this is a graph I created for my uh, series from 2002 until last year. Initially, the majority of cases presented to us were, uh, were due to uh, acute complications or chronic complications with uh, dryness and so on. But later on, we, tried to do it. we started having more and more of patients presenting just for aesthetic reasons without much of the complications. And I presume it's because of improvement of medical therapy. So uh, the etiology of thyroid ID is very well known to us. Autoimmune inflammation with infiltration of extracurricular muscles and fats uh, with T cell and glycosamine glycan full by fibrosis is the reason for crowding of the optal contents, pressure on the optic nerve and all the symptoms that develop later on, as you can see here, the thickening of the muscles. Uh, that led to the description or the, the, that name of Coca-Cola, bottle sign, uh, which is like this. The younger generation of you wouldn't see that, wouldn't know that bottle anymore, but you can see that shape on that muscle. Um, we have to think about the two phases of the thyroid eye disease, the acute phase when there's active inflammation and can take up to 18 months, six to 18 months, and then the chronic phase when there's fibrosis uh, and settling down condition and probably continuing proptosis. You can see the changes here with proptosis in these two patients, but also with chemosis and uh, this patient here. Diplopia because of restricted eye movements, keratitis because of exposure, and optic neuropathy because of pressure progressing to loss of vision. So it is serious. Here is a video of a patient who presented acutely with chemosis and uh, decreased eye movement. The patient has been asked to collaterally, it's not able to. Uh, if you look closely, you can see that his right pupil is dilated as well. Trying to look up, he can't do it. Trying to follow the fingers and up, he just can't do it. It's not, there's not more, much movement at all. And to the left, a bit of movement. So there is restriction of eye movement. I'll show you later after open compression. So the management of the acute phase uh, traditionally been by steroids and sometimes immunosuppression. Later on, biologics were introduced, showing some good results in some patients, and also radiotherapy, radiation. If all this fails, surgery is indicated for emergencies, which is usually eyesight problems. In chronic phase, if the patient has ongoing symptoms for treatment, the only treatment is surgery. Well, where we come here, indications for surgery. So the indications for surgery, as I just said, optic neuropathies, if medical treatments fail, which is all these are in combination, steroids, immunosuppression, biologics, or radiotherapy. Indication also is keratitis because of risk of coronal ulcers and cosmetic uh, aesthetic reason or for dryness. We need fine cut CT scans, just as we do with standard sinus surgery. Uh, 
obviously you need axial and coronal and, and sagittal. It's nice to see the height of the lambda compression to detect how much decompression you can get. The technique is a standard, I'm sure many of you do it, complete sphenoethmodectomy to get complete exposure. So I'll start by a synectomy, exposing the middle of the wall here, and a large sphenoidotomy, and then large inferior uh, middle metatrostomy. You can see the infraorbital nerve here. And then skeletonization of the lambda papyracia, which is very thin, to expose the periosteum, all the way to the skull base and posterior to the annulus, uh, annulus of Zen, where the, all the muscles are uh, inserted. And then removal of orbital floor, if needed, I'll talk about this later. So we're moving this with a 90 degree Blakesley forceps here, uh, down to the infraorbital nerve. And then incision of the periosteum from posterior to anterior so you don't get fat and expose in front of your anterior then you can't see the rest. So here's a video showing uh, standard over the compression on the left side using the uh, micro debrider to do most of it on synectomy, anterior ethmoidectomy, going through the bullet here, complete exposure to the skull base, uh, then doing the posterior ethmoidectomy all the way back. You can see on the left I'm exposing the orbit, then I'm going below the spear terminate here to do the spinodotomy. Obviously, the sinus is normal, so it's much simpler and less bloody than a standard sinus operation. So I'll create a very large uh, spinodotomy. You can see it through here, the optic nerve, carotid, and the carotid uh, optic recess, and removing any remnant of bones on the orbit and the skull base. You can see the Front of size and other nasi right up here, so everything's exposed all the way to the skull base and the orbit. Now I'm removing the lemon pressure. I use the free as elevator on doing this from anterior to posterior. You can see now the yellow color of the fat underneath. You have to be careful with the medial rectus, which is around where you are here, it's closer posteriorly, so anterior uh, incisions are safer, and you will see it quite often when you do this. When I come from the front to back, I use the seeker, lost seeker, or seeker to remove the remnants of the bone anteriorly. It's very simple to do that. And the brighter this to clean any remnants or fragments and so on. Just make sure there's no fragments left anywhere because it can become obstetric. And then I use this skirt tome, it's an ophthalmology knife, from superior, posterior to anterior. So you get exposure superiorly and in the back first, and then you remove the rest. So the fat, as you can see, just immediately bulges out because of the pressure. There's always some septate between these parts of fat that you've exposed and that you can divide later. I'm very careful here. There's not much pressure on this. And if you're pressuring the orbit, make sure that you're away from the muscle. This is just some of the periosteum that is easing off with the keratone. And then a gentle clip forceps, archer forceps, or forceps just to separate any final period of fascia and so on and get the maximum decompression. So that was pure medial wall decompression. This is the result afterwards. You can see what happened later on with some quite a thick part of tissue forming around and protecting the period of fascia still. So there's not much risk of infection or uh, long-term problems with this. So the outcome uh, in the evidence worldwide shows that uh, average reduction of two to nine millimeters, uh, sometimes more than this, but that's average. Keratitis can most usually settle down completely after the endoscopic organ compression and visual acuity, 75%. Expect that because the optic nerve is very sensitive and it has to be done early on. Here's these patients I showed on and to see the top patient after the compression with the proof of all the proptosis and exposure. And this patient, the chemosis, and inflammation exposure has settled down. This is the patient I just showed earlier on the morning of all the decompression. Now he's regained all his eye movements already, and the chemosis is already gone. So that's very quick. Uh, so you can see he's trying, he's looking down, he's looking up, he's looking laterally, and on the on his left. So all the eye movement have come back. Complications has been described that uh, many of these patients get auxiliary in front of sinusitis, and you can uh, imagine. If you drop the orbit like this, block in the auxiliary sinus, that's where it gets. You do have to create large antrostomies to prevent this. This patient has particular anatomy with a problem of a narrow osteo. Diplopia is a problem. It's always a problem with endoscopic orbit compression or any decompression. Uh, and we can still see 
30% of neocurrencies and 70% of worsening of existing diplopia. Until 2005 or 2006, I used to do mebial and fiat decompression for the majority of the patients. We noticed that we had a lot of diplopia. At the same time, these papers were published that shows that mebial and fiat decompression were associated by 70% diplopia, but mebial decompression alone was only associated with 16.6%. At the same time, roughly, Another paper was published by Silva, showed that combined endoscopic medial and external lateral decompression for thyroid eye disease have much less uh, incidence of diplopia than even the three wall decompression and clearly in the medial and, and the fear wall decompression. The reason is the vector of movement of the medial and inferior decompression would be medially inferior like this, so the eyes move the, like that way. And you can see it clearly in this patient before and after decompression with severe squinting. That made us realize that we should not do uh, the combination of medial and inferior uh, in the majority of patients, but medial and lateral are showing in it. This is my own uh, collection of uh, data from for two, two years period, 2002, 2012. We had 81 patients that I had complete records for, 35 years to 82 uh, years of age, uh, mostly females, and the rate of decompression went two to nine millimeters. Just goes with the literature, average is three millimeters. And we did have 3% of uh, Auxiliary sinusitis initially in the series, and later on we started treating large antrostomies. Didn't have any open infection, no CSF leak, and no eyesight deterioration. But again, this shows that we did have a lot of diplopia, especially initially 28% of the diplopia, 7% uh, used prism, and six months it settled, but 6% needed muscle surgery. That was that's quite uh, a big percentage, and all these patients had endoscopic medial and in, and in fear wall decompression, uh, just like what was in the literature. That made us change our practice, and we started doing lateral external decompression combined with medial only for anything, any proportion more than 30 millimeter. Anything less than that, we do endoscopic medial decompression only, no inferior wall. Uh, just very recently, we looked at the acute cases in a year's period 2018, six cases presented with acute thyroid eye disease and eye side problems, uh, three males and six, uh, three females, ages range from 35 to 65. We did over the compression, which is varies within the period of the presentation. Four out of six had a significant improvement in the visual acuities. So you still get 75% improvement. Show examples of chronic thyroid eye disease and decompression for aesthetic reasons. This patient presented just because of aesthetic reasons. Two years of thyroid eye disease. She was offered lit surgery uh, so elsewhere, but she was referred to us and it was a scan, standard scan, and did a decompression, discovery compression, just media wall. She had mild diplopia for three months, settled completely, and she did not need the lit surgery. Another example, a bit less uh, obvious here, you can just see it in the lack of view more. Four years of thyroid eye disease, mainly for it, the decrease in standard scan again. Uh, medial wall decompression, you can see it afterwards, two months post operative with no diplopia at all. Dip limited decompression here. A bit more severe one, you can see even the optic fat uh, here in front of fat, prominent and at upper lid. Five years history of thyroid eye disease, uh, endoscopic medial wall decompression, uh, some, uh, sorry, no diplopia at all. Uh, uh, that's three months post operative with improvement, even of the fat, uh, of the fat pad. Another one with asymmetric proptosis, uh, a bit more on the right and the left. And uh, again, decompression done uh, through a medial wall, but in the right side, a little bit of a fear wall here because it was more severe. You can see it there. And you can imagine, uh, just because of that, she did have diplopia for three months post optically, but settled eventually because we did the fear wall decompression plus the medial. Uh, that's an interesting case. Do I've been doing this when I've asked, I've been asked by ophthalmologists to do it for large eyes for people with uh, no thyroid eye disease. That's a rare indication, but we've done that in a couple of occasions. Uh, we have not published this, but that was like first one was years ago. No thyroid eye disease. You can see that no muscle thickening, nothing else, and endoscopic decompression for large eyes, pure aesthetic reason. Uh, as long as it's done as an MTT work, teamwork, and the patient understands. Uh, low complication rates procedure anyway. So that was done. That is a patient with AV malformation, just to show you uh, an example, unusual indication that we've done only compression for. And cavernous sinus thrombosis in a 15 year old who's not settling with all the medical treatment, with loss of vision, 
either the normal compression error, which had Simon's disease as well. This is the MRI of Venogram showing superior ophthalmic vein becoming a sinus expanded as well. Uh, and there was pressure off the nerve, started having vision loss. I would ask you all the compression that did extensive all the compression, medium and inferior. And very good. In six months, he still had a bit of diplobia, and that is a year after the surgery. No diplobia, settled down, no problems with vision. So, in summary, the uh, scopic compression uh, is safe and effective. Uh, even if it decreases, it can be justifiable uh, in carefully assessed patients. Uh, and, and often in these patients, you don't need lid surgery. And you can be life saving in many of the acute situations as well, like, uh, I mean, by sight sick. Uh, endoscopic optic nerve compression, a less common operation done that we do every now and then. We know that anatomy of the optic nerve is intracranial part, intracranial interorbital part. The intracranial part is this one that's covered by pier arachnoid and dura, is the one that decompressed through the sphenoid just behind the adult uh, If you look at literature on optic canal, uh, so that the orbital bone can be the in 4 to 22%, that's quite high. And it's well identified in up to 68%. So quite often you don't see the optic canal at all, and that can uh, present a problem to you. Interestingly, that uh, all the previous or the earliest uh, publications on this were all uh, from the Japanese uh, literature, 1952, uh, Takahashi, to me in 1969, and uh, from Chita in 74 and 86. Later on, Albert in 1991 presented a paper on the combined endoscopic microscopic control of the compression of the optic nerve. And, and people start to realize that this compression could be done. Indications, the main thing is for traumatic optic neuropathy, which can affect 0.5% to 5% of the patient, even with closed head injuries. So it's not common, but it can happen as you should be aware of other indications that I've seen. Fibrous dysplasia, precious disease and, and precious disease, bone thickening, and intermediate meningiomas, gliomas, and so on. Traumatic optic neuropathy, how when you decide to do an optic nerve decompression, you have to have really great evidence of fracture or narrow the optic canal. That's the best that you can see that sometimes the suspected edema or hematoma you can see in an MRI in the visual optic canal. And the patient is not responding for 24 hours because of high doses, steroids, and everything. And you're still early on uh, after the injury. It's really worth considering. If the patient is getting worse as well, post trauma, it's also worth considering. And how we do it, I go straight to the sphenoid. I don't have to dissect the edemoid, so I do wide endoscopic sphenoidotomy and then drill irrigation. So I use a DCR burr because it's a, it's a diamond burr. And then elevation of the bone when it's thin, thin down of the burr. I, I expose the sheet. Uh, still the debate to incise the teeth, you don't incise it. I tend to incise, incise the sheet of the nerve just to release a bit of CSF, which will close very quickly. And uh, we still don't know if this is essential or not. Just interesting diagram I created about anatomy of the arch, how to avoid it. Uh, the data shows that most of, or 84, 85% of the arch is superior like this in straight column. 15, uh, sorry, 16% of the ophthalmic arch is the right and the left, would be in the inferior medial quadrant. So when you want in incise that sheath, always go superior medial here, never go down here to avoid the arch. I use the sinus navigation for this, especially if the optic canal is not very clear. Here's a patient who's attacked, has an optic hematoma, but also has a fracture in the back here, the skull base, pressing in the optic canal. And it was told, we were told by radiologists, clearly pressing it. The optic canal was not very clear, it's not to be seen at all here, so we used a navigation to find it. So drilling the bone on uh, the optic canal, according to navigation within the sphenoid here. And as you can see, I'm using that diamond burr the DCR burn, and then when you expose it, you thin that bone. I use the spot that's an ear instrument because it's very fine. Elevate that bone, it's not thin enough, you drill it again. When it's thin, some of the fat is exposed here. When it's thin, then you can expose the nerve and you can then cut it to the sheath very gently here. So that's in that patient, and his eyesight improved after that. You can see a slight CSF coming through. And a patient with a meningioma, prior to definitive treatment, you can see tinting of an optic uh, content with pressure on the optic nerve, with us to do optic nerve decompression. And here I'm using this uh, diamond burr again, drilling into the canal, 
just gently to thin the bone with a lot of irrigation so you avoid eating. And when you thin that bone, as I saw in the other, so I keep palpating it with that drill to see how thin it is. When it's thin enough, then we leave it. See, it's getting thinner there. And then when the bone has been removed, you can see the nerve. Interestingly here, this is the ophthalmic artery is quite big. So we can see it there in the inferior quadrant. So that's one of the 16% I explained. So I am lifting some of this bone with this bone seeker because it's very gentle. When I've done that, I just make a very small incision into the sheath of the nerve, avoiding the ophthalmic artery just below my knife here. And you get a birth of CSM. So that patient also has um, uh, had much improved eyesight after that compression. So to finalize the evidence, there are lots of series published. Many of them uh, have good numbers, especially from China, uh, but there's very bad outcomes. Uh, mostly say surgery should be done in 48 hours. Uh, it's a common agreement. Uh, some series show the improvement even after 10 days or even longer. So. This uh, paper was published this year to look into the factors that associated with improvement or, in, or related to a, a improvements over multiple linear regression that showed that poor initial visual acuity and longer time to surgery were the independent risk factors. So these are the main two things. So the earlier you've done it, the better, the better the vision initially, the better outcome as well. So in conclusion, the best is to perform a surgery within, uh, or sorry, as soon as possible after the injury. And management should be planned in, on an individual basis as well, depending on the vision and so on. Thank you very much again, and to Ashok, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the meeting. See you all soon. Thanks, uh, it's, uh, ah, Prof is here. <laughs> Good evening. I totally agree with you that um, doing an orbital decompression, especially in a thyroid patient, is one of the most satisfying operations to do because there is no mucosal uh, disease to worry about um, and, 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 and everything seems to, to look really nice on the video. 
Um, in your thyroid eye patients, do they typically have radiotherapy before they get referred to your service? Because I'm aware that, that the protocols are quite different across, even across the country. Uh, you're on mute, Prof. Yeah, it depends on the presentation. But, so uh, it's probably about 50% of them will have radiotherapy and they're getting less and less. Hmm. Uh, so they mostly they've had some steroids. Yeah, they all get pulse methyl prep. Yeah, methyl prep, really large doses. Yeah, very large doses. Yeah. Some of them will either because you'd be the young ones, you don't want to have the radio. So usually they haven't. Uh, some of them tried biologics, but obviously this, the data is not big enough yet. But they, they're using the biologics globe nowadays. Yeah. Uh, I would say 50% would have had no radiotherapy. Yeah. But 100% have had some steroid therapy. Yes, of course. Yeah. Small yeah. number of biologists. I think what, what the literature lacks at the moment really is that medium long-term um, complication or side effect from having had radiotherapy. Yeah. Because, because I think, you know, um, um, an operation like the ones that we would do is significantly less uh, morbidity than, than say, you know, six courses of radiotherapy in my mind. Yeah. Uh, and it's trying to provide that evidence to our oncologists and certainly to, to, the, to the, uh, the MDT, the thyroid MDT, that actually escalating these patients to the surgical team is much better than, than getting the oncologist involved. Well, the other thing is obviously the access. So luckily- Yes, we, of course, yeah, yeah. Because some hospitals don't have the access, somebody's- No, you're absolutely right. Uh, it, it, it's, it's sometimes uh, uh, pr uh, balanced with, with the availability of the surgical team as well. Um, now in your video, you use the diamond knife. Um, um, do you bend the tip? to get a better contact with the periorbiter, especially with the posterior incision. Because I find that the knife is, is, is not, not at a particular angle to kind of get the tip on the periorbiter. This one has especially a knife. Back, yeah. yeah, it's a keratome that ophthalmologists use for yeah. a keratome. Yeah. So this one is especially one with a longer blade. Mm. So really nice. I can't remember what's it called. It's a disposable one. But yes. the short one that I had to bend, but sometimes yes. this one is quite nice, the newer one. Okay. The name. I, 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 <laughs> it's an ophthalmology set. So just yes, it. yes. We, we use the, uh, the disposable one as well, and, and I don't know what the name is. It's just a purple colored handle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, but I, I tend to kind of bend it a little bit more just to try and get uh, a, more, yeah. a more 90 degree cut onto the periorbiter, especially for the back, really. Yeah, the one in the back, yeah. And that's yeah. used to have, but they gave me more recently as a, as a longer one. Ah, right. Okay. I need to ask them. Okay. Obviously, a sickle knife. Always broken and always just you can't yeah, use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never use. <laughs> it's always blunt. Yeah. yeah. Now I've got a question from 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 um, the the audience. Uh, in lateral in the lateral uh, external decompression, do you involve the ophthalmologist? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And and, and how does your ophthalmologist prevent an unsightly scar? Uh, they they do it in the in the creases here. Mm. Uh, the ophthalmologists who work with me, they also uh, ocular plastics anyway. So they do it very gently. I mean, when you see ophthalmologists operating, it's very nice. They're very yeah. gently. Yes. And they use 7-0 Vicar for stitching the skin quite often as well. Mm. Yeah. It's very nice. It's got it within the creases here. Yeah. Obviously, when you see that picture, I'm sure it looks horrendous. But after that, when you see that, <laughs> you see. Yeah. I, 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 yeah, I think they, they, they tend to go for the extended subsidiary incision, isn't it? Quite often you do Some, that. Something like that. I, I, yeah, but yeah. Uh, because we need a lot of drilling. Yeah. But yeah, right. but yeah I, I don't do it myself. I mean, if we can, yeah. but I, we have lists with our formalist joint lists and it's really nice work to do with them. So we do it jointly. Totally agree. Uh, no more questions. I've just scanned the chat and also the Q&A. Uh, certainly no more questions. So I'm going to hand back to Ashok now. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And over to you, Ashok. The head and neck surgeries you perform are vital. Your patients place their trust in you. You help them continue to speak and smile, eat and drink, hear and comfort. You're committed to helping them continue to live fully, to feel deeply, and to enjoy the quality of life they've come to expect. That means being confident that you're protecting and preserving your patient's head and neck nerve function during procedures. 
Introducing NIM Vital, the next generation of nerve monitoring technology. NIM Vital provides advanced nerve monitoring that helps you reduce the risk of nerve damage during head and neck procedures. Detailed intraoperative nerve condition information helps inspire your surgical strategy. An intuitive user interface with a wire-free patient interface allows for easy setup and enhanced visualization from the surgical field. Real-time notifications of nerve conditions, visually and audibly. Green, yellow, and red status bars provide visual information, and their associated tones provide audible cues, making monitoring function easier than ever. NIM Nerve Trend EMG reporting enables nerve condition tracking throughout a procedure, even when using intermittent nerve monitoring. And when paired with a NIM continuous monitoring electrode, you have continuous nerve monitoring informing your surgical strategy. NIM Vital pushes the boundaries of monitoring nerve function in various procedures in head and neck surgery. With real-time information available during surgery, giving you confidence in nerve function. Because protecting patients' nerves and senses is more than vital. NIM Vital. Imagine, what if you could do even more to bring relief to your chronic rhinosinusitis patients with technology customized to your unique clinical and facility needs? Introducing Stealth Station Flex ENT Navigation System, a customizable system from Medtronic ENT, a market leader in image-guided surgery technology, featuring six hardware configurations, an optional portable card, two different electromagnetic emitter options. With flexibility in hardware design and optional software functionality, get everything you need and nothing you don't with Stealth Station Flex ENT. Let's flex forward. Contact your Medtronic representative to customize a navigation solution that's right for you.